love to think of nature as an unlimited broadcasting system through which God speaks to us every hour if we will only tune him in. One of the things that has helped me as much as any other is not when I'm going to die, but how much I can do while I'm alive. But a Negro can't. Uh, but a Negro can. There is opportunity enough for anyone to do what the world needs done. You must not let the haters of this world divert you from the path of your own duty. For the time will come when the haters will be consumed by their own hatred. I'm suspicious of any man who claims to be boss in his own house. He will lie about other things, too. There's no shortcut to achievement. Life requires thorough preparation. Veneer isn't worth anything. Success does not depend on the style of clothes you wear, nor the amount of money you put in the bank. It is service to others that counts. Born into slavery and reared in Reconstruction, George Washington Carver struggled through poor health, poverty, and prejudice to become a great benefactor, not only to his people, but to his country as well. near Neosha, Missouri, where I remained until I was about nine years old. As nearly as I can tell, I was about two weeks old when the Civil War closed. My parents were both slaves. Father was killed shortly after my birth while hauling wood to town on an ox wagon. When I was very young, my sister, mother, and I were stolen by bushwhackers and sold in Arkansas. Mr. Carver, the, the gentleman who owned my mother, sent a man for us, but only I was brought back, nearly dead from whooping cough. My body was very feeble, and it was a constant warfare between life and death to see who would gain the mastery. From a child, I had an inordinate desire for knowledge, especially music, painting, flowers, and the sciences. Day after day, I spent in the woods alone in order to collect my floral beauties. Many are the tears I shed because I would break the roots or the flowers while removing them from the ground. And strange to say, all sorts of vegetation seemed to thrive under my touch until I was styled the plant doctor, and plants from all over the county would be brought to me for treatment. Rocks had an equal fascination, 
and many are the basketfuls that I brought to the chimney corner of the old log house. Mr. and Mrs. Carver were very kind to me. They encouraged me to secure knowledge, helping me all they could, but this was, was quite limited. As we lived in the country, no colored schools were available, so I was permitted to go eight miles to a school in Neosho. That boy told me he came to Neosho to find out what made hail and snow and whether a person could change the color of a flower by changing the seed. <laughs> Imagine. I told him he'd never find all that out in Neosho, nor in Joplin either, and maybe not in Kansas City. But all the time I knew he'd find it out somewhere. In Neosho, George stayed with Mariah and Andrew Watkins. After observing his keen mind and eagerness to learn, Mariah told him, That's what you must do, George. You must learn all you can, and then go out into the world and give your learning back to our people. They're starving for a little learning. In 1876, Carver left Neosho, Missouri, and went to Fort Scott, Kansas. It was the beginning of a 20-year quest for education and knowledge. At Fort Scott, he cooked for a local family, started his own laundry service, worked for a blacksmith, and whenever he could, went to school. One day, he saw a young Negro boy lynched and set on fire by an unruly mob of whites. He would never forget that violent act of racial hatred. The next morning, he gathered up his belongings and left town. Wandering through Kansas, he worked menial jobs, saved his money, and attended school. Frequently starting a grade in one small town and finishing it in another. During the spring of 1885, he completed high school in Minneapolis, Kansas. In Minneapolis, there was another George Carver, so to avoid confusion, he added a middle initial to his name. When jokingly asked if the W stood for Washington, he grinned and said, why not? But he never used it, not even in later life when he was known by all three names. In the fall of 85, he was refused admission because of his color to a small college in Highland, Kansas. It was a deep hurt. His dreams of furthering his education were shattered. In 1886, he filed a homestead claim in western Kansas and built a sod house. A year or so later, he drifted to a small village in Iowa. At Winterset, he made friends with a prominent local family who encouraged him to attend a college nearby. A teacher at Simpson recalled, he came to us with a satchel full of poverty and a burning zeal to know everything. Carver majored in art, and his painting of a yucca plant would later on win him a prize at the Chicago World's Fair. But his art teacher, knowing how difficult it was for even white artists to earn a living, persuaded him to go to Iowa State College and specialize in his second love, agriculture. Carver was the first black person to attend Iowa State, the first to graduate, and the first to be appointed to the faculty. While learning an advanced degree, he was put in charge of the school greenhouses. A distinguished botanist at the college described him as a brilliant student, the best scientific observer he had ever known. On April 1st, 1896, Booker T. Washington, founder of a small college for Negroes in Tuskegee, Alabama, wrote Carver a letter. I can teach our people how to read and write and how to build a wall. 
but I don't know how to teach them to plow and plant and harvest. I cannot offer you money, position, or fame. I offer you in their place the hard task of bringing a people from degradation, poverty, and waste to full manhood. For Carver, it was the answer to the one great ideal of his life. Now, he could go out into the world and give his learning back to his people. Tuskegee, expecting to stay only three or four years. He ended up staying the rest of his life. After he arrived, Washington told him, your department exists only on paper. And your laboratory will have to be in your head. To build a laboratory, Carver led his students to the trash heaps and junkyards of Tuskegee. Now, all of this may seem to be just junk, but it is only waiting for us to apply our intelligence to it. The laboratory was makeshift, except for a microscope that was Carver's going away present at Iowa State. For the first classes, it was a valuable experience. As they graduated into a world of poverty and want, they realized success did not require expensive and elaborate equipment. To anyone who would listen, Carver explained how most plants drained life-giving nitrogen from the soil, and cotton was one of the worst. The long reign of King Cotton had scorched and depleted the land. Small farmers could no longer make a living. Carver encouraged them to grow sweet potatoes, cow peas, soybeans, and peanuts. These plants would give nitrogen back to the soil and make the earth rich again. But they were afraid to try something new. Finally, what Carver could not accomplish a small insect did. On a statue in Enterprise, Alabama, the inscription reads, in profound appreciation of the boll weevil and what it has done. From Mexico to Texas, through Texas, through Louisiana and into Mississippi, by 1915, the boll weevil had reached Alabama. Burn off your infested cotton and plant peanuts. But still, no one listened. Then, one day, an elderly widow knocked on Carver's door. After planting and harvesting peanuts, she had hundreds of pounds left over. Who would buy the surplus? To his surprise, Carver discovered barns and storehouses piled high with peanuts. Peanuts were rotting in the fields because there was no market for them. Years later, he recalled how he retreated to his favorite spot in the woods and cried out, Oh, Mr. Creator, why did you make this universe? And the Creator answered, You want to know too much for that little mind of yours. Ask me something more your size. So I said, Dear Mr. Creator, tell me what man was made for. Again, he spoke to me and said, Little man, you are still asking for more than you can handle. Cut down the extent of your request and improve the intent. And then, I asked my last question. Mr. Creator, why did you make the peanut? That's better, the Lord said. 
and he gave me a handful of peanuts and went back with me to the laboratory, and together we got down to work. Working day and night, he tore apart the peanut and unlocked the chemical magic that would turn loss into profit. In less than five years, Enterprise Alabama was the county seat for one of the wealthiest sections of the state. During his lifetime, Carver extracted more than 300 products from the peanut. Shortly after coming to Tuskegee, Carver began to distribute bulletins on farm improvement. But what good were bulletins to farmers who couldn't read? So, he made a bulletin 20 acres across the school farm. And if you lived too far away to come and see it, you could expect him in your front yard some Sunday morning. I'm from the Institute, he would say. My name is Carver. And then he'd get to work. Of all his accomplishments, Carver believed the movable school to be his most significant. It was above everything else, reaching the man farthest down, helping those who needed it the most. Carver and his assistants flooded the countryside with free information. A plant needs certain things, and the soil has certain things to give. It's the farmer's job to make the right adjustment between the two. Plow deep. Help those roots get down there where the good is. Rotate your crops. If the same crop is planted on the same piece of ground year after year, the soil never gets a chance to rest. Your chickens aren't sick because the brown one was hatched on a full moon and put a hex on the other. They're sick because no sunlight gets into the coop to dry it out. He told them that weeds were only vegetables growing in the wrong place. Okra in a cornfield was a nuisance, but in its own patch, it made a hearty soup. The giant thistle contained definite medicinal properties, as did some 250 other weeds identified by Carver. Before he left each place, he would always give them some flower seeds for their door yard. Don't forget, a flower is God's silent messenger. In 1915, Booker T. Washington's leadership came to an end. For 33 years, he had pushed, pulled, and praised his students into graduating with knowledge and self-respect. From its humble beginning, Tuskegee had prospered to become both nationally and internationally known. Washington believed that high moral character and hard labor were the keys to success. If Tuskegee could produce qualified teachers and technicians, scholars would follow. The school itself was literally built on this principle. Construction and brick making were part of the curriculum. On more than one occasion, Washington said, we ask for nothing which we can do ourselves. Nothing has been bought that students could produce. Both Washington and Carver were frequently criticized for not being more outspoken against segregation. Washington protested that instead of cursing the white race, he chose to perform a service that would uplift his own. And he was often heard to say, no man can drag me down so low as to make me hate him. Most of his life, Carver felt the heavy hand of prejudice, but he refused to lead a crusade. If I use my energy struggling to right every wrong done to me, I, I would have no energy left for my work. In 1910, after he was placed in charge of agricultural research,
Carver devoted most of his time to creative science. Besides bulletins, he wrote a syndicated newspaper column. He made lecture tours and received delegations from other countries. And he expanded the experimental farm in size and variety. stopping his curiosity, and there was seemingly no end to his scientific contributions. He made concrete from cotton and rubber from the milk of the goldenrod. He developed new strains of vegetables and new methods of soil fertilization. And from the Alabama soil, he produced different kinds of paints. I am not sure that I am worthy of this splendid citation, but uh, I wish to say also that I thank you from the depths of my heart. He received honors, doctorates, citations, medals, and lavish praise from every level of society. Yet, he remained indifferent to personal fortune. He frequently turned down offers to work in private industry. When someone pointed out that with all that money, he could really help his people, he invariably replied, if I had all that money, I might forget about my people. He never applied for a patent, saying it would take too much time. And besides, he didn't want his discoveries benefiting favored persons. Most of the time, he wore the same old tattered cap and baggy clothes. Yet whatever he wore, he never failed to have a fresh flower in his lapel. If someone commented about the flower, his eyes would light up. Do you know what's inside this flower? At Tuskegee, he repeatedly refused pay raises and gave the school auditors fits because he never bothered to cash his paychecks, except to help a needy student or to assist a worthy cause. After he was finally persuaded to put his money in a bank, the bank failed. When the news reached Carver, he reacted calmly. I suppose that's what happens when you hoard. A close friend, however, was quite alarmed. Don't you realize all your money is gone? To which he responded, Well, wherever it's gone, I guess they had more uses for it than I did. When asked why he never married, Carver usually smiled and said, What woman would want a husband who was forever dropping soil specimens all over her parlor? And how could I explain to a wife that I had to go out at four o'clock every morning? to talk to flowers. He also knew that his first loyalty was to his work and that his attitude toward money and material possessions would be fatal to a marriage. For years, the most popular extracurricular activity on campus was Carver's Bible class. It began when small groups of students wanted to know more about the relationship between science and the scriptures. It climaxed when every Sunday evening, the 300-seat assembly hall in Carnegie Library was filled to capacity. Carver would compare the presence of God to electricity. Even though you can't see him, 
he's always there, just waiting for you to make contact. And he would relate the miracle of creation to a common flower. The seed that made this flower was created millions of years ago. It survived drought, blizzards, and the assaults of man himself. And in this flower is the beginning of a seed that will grow millions of years after all of us are gone. Now, can any of you believe that the miracle of this flower is no more than an accident? After World War II began, Carver published his last bulletin and bought some United States savings bonds. I want the world to understand that a man's color has nothing to do with the love he feels for his country. On January 5th, 1943, George Washington Carver died in his sleep. He died without any known relatives. Yet for three days, thousands of people came from near and far to pay their final respects. On the fourth day, they carried him up to the same hill where his comrade, Dr. Washington, had been buried 27 years before. And that's what you must do, George. You must learn all you can, and then, Go out into the world and give your learning back to our people.